from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Chris Murphy. I'm the head of the Near East section. And uh, the Near East section is one of three in the African Middle Eastern Division. The other two sections are the African section, whose staff is responsible for developing the collection from and about Sub-Saharan Africa. The Hebraic section, whose staff is responsible for developing the collection about uh, Judaica worldwide. And the Near East section, uh, we are rather diverse, to say the least. Uh, the staff of the section is responsible for developing the uh, collection from and about all of the Arab countries, uh, former Soviet Central Asia, Turkey, uh, Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and the Caucasus, Iran and Afghanistan, uh, and the Muslims in Western China, Russia, and the Balkans. And as I said, the staff uh, are primarily responsible for developing the collection from and about this area, but they are also the individuals who make uh, available the collection, who help researchers you know, access the materials they need in what is a very large collection now. Um, we have almost half a million books. About 50% are in Arabic. And then there are about 75 to 80,000 each in Turkish and Persian. The rest of the collection is made up of some 36 other languages. Very prominent among them is Armenian that must now be close to 40,000, if not above that, um, followed by uh, Azerbaijani, Uzbek, all the way down to Ingush, a people of the North Caucasus, and we possess 12 books published in their language, and that is actually phenomenal growth because we used to only have nine. I mentioned that the uh, staff here is responsible for access to the collections, and they're also responsible to tell the public or to provide venues to allow the public to learn about our holdings and the kinds of subjects that we cover. And to that end, uh, the staff often uh, contact scholars, especially ones who have been working here in the division or they've met working in the library or at conferences, and invite them to uh, make presentations. And uh, in this case, uh, Dr. Mohamed Salti, one of the Arab world specialists, uh, has contacted and asked today's speaker and as I said, Muhannad is one of our Arab world specialists. He did his doctorate at Chicago and has been with us since 2008. And um, now, without further ado, I'd ask Muhannad to come forward and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Um, our speaker today, Sheila Kaufman, is an award-winning cookbook author of no less than 26 books. She is also a popular cooking teacher and culinary lecturer with expertise in Middle Eastern and Mediterranean cuisines. She's a food editor and partner in cookbook construction crew that helps writers and would-be authors with their cookbooks. Uh, with her engaging person personality and natural ease in front of an audience, Sheila began a new career 40 years ago uh, in the culinary arts, uh, traveling from Alaska to Hawaii, from Maine to Mexico, teaching easy, elegant, fearless international cooking and writing for newspapers and magazines. As a prolific writer and editor, Sheila is a food editor for popular anthropology and the Maryland chain, The Town Courier, in addition, she is a freelance writer. Uh, she has written for numerous magazines and papers, including The Vegetarian Times, Eating Well, The Washington Post, Tampa Tribune, The Jewish Journal of Greater Los Angeles, and The Baltimore Sun. 
She is a contributing editor to a number of papers in the United States and a founding member of the International Association of Culinary Professionals. She is also a popular lecturer and expert on Mediterranean cooking, on culinary traditions and history. She's has, she has been an invited guest speaker for Epcot's uh, Food and Wine Festival, the Smithsonian Institution, uh, and the Textile Museum. She has taught and lectured on Turkish cuisines at Les Dames at the, the, uh, Descoffier, uh, the Turkish Embassy, uh, the Turkish Society of Canada, Brandeis, Chow, diplomatic groups, and other special interest groups and organizations. She has also been a frequent guest on television and radio programs across the nation and in Canada, including Martha Stewart's uh, radio show. So now, without further ado, Sheila Kaufman. Thank you, I'm very honored to be here, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate an audience that hopefully is interested in my topic. So let's start. Turkey is a country whose history is mirrored in food. Layer upon layer, Far Eastern Asian, Anatolia, Mediterranean, each reflecting a long and complex history of migration that enabled the Turkish people both to exert and receive influences all across Eurasia. Turkish cuisine is both cosmopolitan and rustic, delicate and hearty, traditional and experimental. It is a complex amalgam of east, west, north, and south, a compelling magnet for many traditions at one of the world's greatest centers of culture and commerce. Turkish cuisine is based on the creativity of housewives, of the geography of the region, years of foreign trade, and enhance and maintain by the lavish traditions maintained by the palace chefs during the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans were renowned for their refined tastes. <coughs> Excuse me. Turkish food is wonderfully spiced and can have complex flavors. There are unusual combinations of flavors and beautiful presentation is important. The diet is a very healthful one delicately seasoned, and more intensely flavored with herbs and spices, as parsley, dill, mint, thyme, and bay leaf. The diet is based on a great variety of foods. More vegetables, fruits, beans, and grains than meat are eaten. And the cuisine's most important characteristic is its reliance on the very fresh ingredients and the cooking methods to bring out the natural flavors. Fish is eaten on the day it's caught. Vegetables and fruit are eaten during the season they're grown and purchased daily, or in Anatolia, they're dried for winter use. Um, it is said there are three major cuisines in the world, Turkish, Italian, and French. East is based on local ingredients and flavors. My, by many, while many well-known national cuisines rely on one basic element, for instance, French cuisine, people think sauce, pasta, forms the essence of the Italian kitchen. But there is no single dominant feature in the Turkish kitchen. No one can name one thing that would characterize this. Turkey stands at the crossroads of many cultures and is a land with a timeless history of over 10,000 years and a food and wine culture that dates back to 4,000 BC. The Turks introduced coffee to Europe and gave the Dutch their famous tulips. The Dutch uh, tulips were not indigenous to Holland. They just grow wild all over Turkey. And at one point, the Sultan gave a Turkish, the uh, Dutch ambassador a little bag of bulbs. And this man went home and thought, hmm, what can I do with these? And the result was everyone thinks tulips come from Holland. 70% uh, of the world's hazelnuts uh, are grown in Turkey, and Santa Claus is from Turkey. It was St. Dimitri. Uh, Mount Arat, uh, the history of Turkey goes back to the Stone Age settlements of 7500 BC. And over centuries, parts of Turkey have been under the control of the Hittites, Persians, Romans, Ottoman Turks. An oral history of Turkish cuisine is thought to have begun in biblical times. Most of the Turkish oral cuisine has been lost. According to legend, Noah's Ark landed on Mount Arat in eastern Turkey. And the last meal that was served aboard the vessel was a pudding called a zur. 
containing nearly 20 ingredients, although say some say 40, one for each day of rain, uh, of leftover food. 10,000 years ago in Anatolia, the people possessed a culinary culture sophisticated for such an early date. The people grew beans, lentils, and wheat, and they used salt, they extracted oil from plants, and fat from milk. Um, this just to show <clears throat> one of the arts of the nomadic people who populated um, the mountains of Central Asia. And as they traveled towards Anatolia, which was Asia Minor, they encountered different culinary traditions which they assimilated into their own cooking. And their carpet weaving uh, is one of the things they were famous for. And during their early nomadic life, the early Turks depended on agriculture and breeding of domestic animals. Now, the Central Asian Turks consumed mutton, goat meat, and beef. And the meat was prepared in a tinder, an underground oven, or grilled in an open water charcoal fire as kebabs. Kaverma was another famous. Uh, small cubes of meat cooked in its own fat, salted and stored in large earthenware containers, and eaten in winter months. Pasturma was a preserved meat, salted, spiced, and dried in the sun. These foods are still a very important part of Turkish cuisine. Now, milk and dairy products had a special place. Mare's milk, which is high in vitamin C, was valued over sheep or cow's milk. And the milk was simmered in a large, shallow pan, and the cream would rise to the surface and form a crust. The crust was eaten, and the remaining milk was dried in the sun and then stored as a powder. And milk and thick cream were the basic elements of their breakfast. But the queen of dairy products was one of their inventions. Anybody? Yogurt, uh, an important component of early Turkish diet and now regarded as one of the most famous Turkish culinary contributions to the world. Now, rounding out their basic foods were grains, primarily wheat and barley, and they were boiled, dried, and cracked wheat, bulgur. And this is still a very important cereal in the nutrition of the Turkish people. And by the way, it's becoming very important now in the American diet. Um, I'm sure I'll repeat this later, but the Mediterranean diet of today was the Turkish diet of a thousand years ago. Um, they made um, a yufka bread that's still made the same way today, flour, salt, and water. Uh, rounded and cooked on a thin iron plate. <coughs> As each group of peoples, the Hittites, the Phoenicians, the Lydians, the Byzantines, the Romans, Persians, Arabs, Seljuks, Mongols, Crusaders, and Ottomans crossed Anatolia from east to west, they added to the culinary pool, thereby enriching the indigenous Turks' own cultural characteristics and cooking techniques. Now, the Persian, Hittite, and Byzantine empires introduced different vegetables to the Turkish cuisine. Cabbage, cauliflower, and parsley, all of Mediterranean origin. And Turkish cuisine was greatly influenced by Iran's use of a combination of meats and vegetables, or meat and fruit in what is, for us, stews. So that came from the Persians. Pilaf um, is a Turkish version of uh, Persian rice dishes. So Turkish and Iranian elements are gradually led to a cuisine that the Mongols transplanted to India, where it was enhanced and changed. And in addition, because Anatolia heritage was built up over a period of thousands of years, these scores of civilizations were composed of a region with exceptionally rich flora and fauna, and many spices found their way into the kitchen. Even with the advancement in technology and agriculture, many of the methods of food pre preparation, preserving, cooking, and baking are still used in rural Turkey today. And Turkish cuisine holds a place of its own, resisting the encroachment of fast food in homes and restaurants. If you go to Turkey, you're not really going to find fast food restaurants unless they're American. Um, Turks want good food, they go home to eat it, or they go into a restaurant where uh, a member of a family, uh, father, son, grandma, mother, uh, is the cook. So in effect, they're eating someone else's home cooking. Travelers, merchants, peddlers, preachers, rabbis, teachers, students, beggars, and pilgrims pass through Turkey on their way to and from the Holy Land. 
and these people were vehicles of gastronomic knowledge as they carried the news and descriptions of the exotic dishes and far off lands. Sometimes they even brought ingredients from their homelands which were introduced uh, into the culinary pool. <clears throat> Upon settling in Anatolia, the Turks adopted Arab cuisine, adding dishes based on wheat, mutton, and seafood dishes when they reached the Aegean and Mediterranean seas. Now, Chinese and Mongol influences to Turkish cuisine included homemade noodles and manti, little pastas that we think of as ravioli. These recipes are still used today and are about 1,400 years old and have not changed at all. Other new foods were new fruits, vegetables, and herbs. Um, as well as olive oil that had not existed in Central Asia. And again, this became a basis later um, for the diet. Traditional Turkish dishes utilized a variety of vegetables, beans, grains, fresh fruits, herbs, and yogurts. Now, vegetables were the preferred staple of everyday food and a very integral part of the majority of um, Turkish food. The Turks revered vegetables then and they still revere vegetables today. Vegetables are served as main courses, along with a salad and bread. And the way this happened was the Ottomans became experts at taking a simple vegetable and through culinary embellishment turned it into an exquisite morsel, especially in the art of stuffing vegetables. Uh, if you go in a Greek or Lebanese restaurant, uh, you might order Iman Bialdi stuffed eggplant with vegetables, but that's a Turkish dish. So sometimes in Lebanese and Greek restaurants you will be eating Turkish food, um, unchanged from the way it was uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Eggplant is the queen of vegetables, and any cook worth their salt <clears throat> can prepare eggplant in at least 40 different ways. Other, pepper, other uh, vegetables that were favored were bell peppers, tomatoes, okra, squash, and cucumber. And the recorded history of Turkish cuisine is thought to have begun in the 10th century when the Turks came into contact with the Iranian islamic culture. And they learned again the rice dishes from the Persian, and then they took that, enhanced them, and then created their own rice dishes. The Seljuks introduced new fruits, vegetables, and herbs, and new sources for olive oil. And again, they would take recipes and ingredients, incorporate them, and make them their own. They turned uh, the grand cuisine of medieval Baghdad into something really impressively elegant, which involved into what was called the imperial cuisine. Okay, I forgot to... <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the Abbasids placed great importance on cooking, and their philosopher began to write a lot about it as an art form. And their system of government began to pattern itself around Persian models, and so did their recipes. Uh, in the 11th and 12th centuries, much of the power was transferred from Baghdad to the Seljuks, who were a Turkish dynasty, and this laid a rich culinary foundation for the Ottoman Empire to build on. Uh, now the Turks are now neighbors of the Greeks. So some Greek influence was felt, especially in the baking of round loaves of bread, as opposed to the flat breads of many of the other countries. Um, in addition, from the 11th to the 14th century, a lot of Greek words were applied to fish and seafood dishes. Under the reign of the emperor Murat II, 1421 to 1444, uh, and the father of Mehmet the Conqueror, the meals were very, very simple, and varieties were rare in both the imperial and the popular tables. The development of the Ottoman cuisine actually began when Murat II ascended the throne. The most significant impact on Turkish cuisine came during the rise of the Ottoman Empire and the reign of Mehmet II, who conquered Istanbul in 1453. The culinary arts played an important part of court life with Topkapı Palace, the center of the empire, with all culinary activities. Mehmet was a gourmand, and the richest and most diverse flavors found in the dishes were prepared during his reign. Excuse me. Ottoman meals always began with broth and ended with the sweet. 
Deemed to be healthful foods, broths were prepared with beef or chicken stock, yogurt, or fish stock, and then they would add rice, dried wheat, dried fresh fruits, dried vegetables, and roots. And the Turks believed that having broth first prepared the stomach for all the food that was going to follow. Um, any good cook during this time period would have a repertoire of over 100 soups. And evidence of soups' importance among the Ottomans could be found in the worries of grandmothers and mothers who feared that they would not be able to marry off the family's youngest daughters who could not cook a decent soup. Um, the conquest of the Ottoman Empire's eating and drinking begins to change with the conquest of Istanbul because this is when it went from a tribal to a universal empire and the culinary habits began to become universal with the adoption and assimilation of the Byzantine customs and the Turks had found a whole new array of foods and eating habits much closer to our practices of eating than to that in medieval Europe at the same time. Uh, stuffed grape leaves was one of the main features. Um, and 16th century Turkish foods had its be beginnings with an Arab book uh, written in the 15th century. And a later version became the first Turkish cookbook. And mentioned in this work are dolmas, uh, nut stuffed sweets, common foods, and the fabulous sorbets or fruit syrups. Uh, the sorbets were served with ice and snow from the mountains that were stored in elaborate ice houses. And they were built specifically for the purpose of keeping ice year round. Now, not necessarily for you and me. Um, it always seemed to be in the beginning that it was for royalty and the wealthy. Just like chocolate and coffee and tea were at the time. At the height of its glory in the 16th century, the Ottoman Empire spread east to west from Baghdad to Tripoli and north to south from Budapest to Cairo, which was a major spice city, a sister city to Venice, which the Turks also controlled. Now, I thought it very interesting that once the Turks conquered a nation, they rarely sought to impose their culture, and there was no unifying language. So if I conquered you, not only did you keep your language, you kept your religion. I did not care. All I wanted was your taxes. And so it was a time when Christians, Arabs, Jews, Muslims all lived together very peacefully for hundreds and hundreds of years. This was a palace grocery list in 1661. The palace went through 36,000 bushels of rice, 3,000 pounds of noodles, 500,000 bushels of chickpeas, 12,000 pounds of salt in one year. And in 1723, the meat supply was 3,000 head of beef, 60,000 of mutton, 20,000 of veal, and 200,000 fowl, and 100,000 pigeons. Uh, 250 tons of bread were baked in Istanbul every day. And um, a list of deliveries to the palace notes the arrival of 2,000 pounds of cloves, nutmeg, and 206 pounds of saffron, if you can imagine what that would be worth uh, today. These were probably used to flavor the pilafs uh, that were favorite dishes of the sultan. I found that Americans know very little about geography. Uh, I was a school teacher before I got into this. And um, they really don't know <laughs> very much about countries outside of our own. Uh, I know we try and teach them, but uh, with more and more travel being accessible to more and more ages, I know even my nine-year-old grandson is taking a trip to Boston with his school. Um, Americans will become much more familiar with other countries, their cultures, their cuisines, and most importantly, where they're located. Uh, people had no idea of how big the Ottoman Empire was. It, it composed, in my mind, probably about half of the world. So these are the modern names of the countries that were part of the Ottoman territories. And this goes from the end of the 1300s to the founding of um, the Ataturk. So you have, um, in Europe, you have Albania, Bosnia, Bulgaria, Crete, Crimea, Greece, Herzegovina, Hungary, Slovenia, Macedonia, Montenegro, North Aegean Islands, Rhodes, Moldavia, Transylvania, and Serbia. 
in Asia. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you have Armenia, Azerbaijan, Persia, Georgia, uh, Iraq, Kuwait, Jordan, Lebanon, Oman, Palestine, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Yemen. And in Africa, Algeria, Egypt, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Nubia, Dufar, uh, Tunisia, just to name a few. So think about um, all of this. And this was all new culinary territory. And I read uh, a description of the Ottomans during this time period. They were called culinary plunderers because wherever they conquered, all they <laughs> cared about was send home the best foods, the best ingredients, and the best recipes to Topkapi Palace. Uh, in fact, Marie Antoinette's chef came to work at Topkapi Palace after she was beheaded. And I think there's, in my eyes, one Turkish recipe that has a French uh, influence, and that's um, Sultan's Delight, which is eggplant that's cooked and then smashed to pieces and mixed with bechamel sauce. And you know the Turks did not invent bechamel sauce. And then a slow-cooked lamb stew is served on top of this. So I think they had a little bit of um, French beside the Arab influence and, and the others. Now, dishes emerged under Suleiman the Magnificent. The creations from the palace reached such dizzying heights of indulgence that they ended up with humorous or sensuous names like young ladies' breasts, ladies' thighs, ladies' navels. Uh, the recipes are still called by these names today. They're still cooked and eaten today. And cooking was regarded as an art form and eating a pleasure. And this is a legacy that remains the uh, basis for Turkish cooking today. And if the Ottomans were culinary plungers, they were dedicated to the pleasures of the table, and the palace cooks um, perfected the recipes they gathered from across their empire. Some of the earliest fusion cooking began with the Ottomans to create one of the world's greatest cuisines. Um, the palace cooks plundered the markets for exotic ingredients to produce more ambitious meals. In the 17th century, a Venetian ambassador was shocked to find himself at a banquet of 130 courses. Uh, if there was an excess, there was a true devotion to the sensual pleasures of the table and a continuing quest for the refinement of the dishes. Now, in the 16th and 17th centuries, the Ottomans traded with the Spaniards who introduced them to many new products from the New World. So into Istanbul from Arab traders and Spanish traders came chili peppers, tomatoes, and maize, which were very quickly absorbed into the palace cuisine and eventually out into the marketplace uh, where the housewives could begin to get these items and use their own creativity in creating their own recipes. And this, again, is the basis right there of what was called the Mediterranean diet today. These grains, these vegetables, these fruits. Um, the kitchen staff grew to 1,370 people. All of them lived in the palace grounds. But each one had a different job. So there was the jam man, and the soup man, and the bread man, and on and on and on ad infinitum. And, uh, each, each dish was regarded as a separate skill. So if you made soup, you never made anything else. And so she made the bread. Someone else made the candy. Someone else prepared the fish. Um, and it never changed. And every Ottoman city was a shopping center. How many have been to Istanbul, to the Grand Bazaar? Uh, nothing was more glorious than Istanbul's Grand Bazaar. Now, this was a small town in itself. It was built in 1493 and had 67 main streets and 4,000 shops, all under one roof. Uh, spices, dried fruits, nuts, seeds, Turkish delights, and edibles filled most of the shops. But today, when you walk in, it's jewelry that's going to hit you uh, first. But this was prime real estate, and it was built right on the Golden Horn. It has not changed uh, since 1492. It also had an Egyptian bazaar, or a spice market, which stands very close. 
was built in 1664. And you just walk through rows of candies and nuts and spices and everything is just piled like you see it here. And you get a little bag and you fill it with what you want. But they also had caviar from the Black Sea and butter from Moldova, olives, dried fish from Greece, fruits and nuts from the Balkans, dates from Egypt, and even live trout that came from Macedonia's rivers. Uh, as time passed, olive oil became the alternative for butter, and sugar replaced honey and great molasses in desserts. Cumin, coriander, cinnamon, mustard, pepper, and saffron were the most common spices, and parsley and mint, the primary herbs. And onions and garlic were very important in the cooking of the Turks. Uh, with over 5,000 miles of shoreline, fish and seafood are abundant in the seas around Turkey, and some of the best fish and seafood in the world is found the Black Sea, the Sea of Marmara, the Aegean, the Mediterranean, the Bosporus. Everything from lobster and mussels to swordfish, sea bass, mackerel, sardines, and anchovies. Um, I have to say the Turks worship anchovies. They worship them so much they make a dessert uh, using them, and they also love sardines. Desserts were everywhere, but they're usually fresh fruits in season, puddings or compotes. Uh, spring started with strawberries and then came cherries and apricots. By the way, Turkey has not only banana plantations, but tea plantations, besides growing almonds, hazelnuts, and pistachio. Uh, apricots are another thing that Turkey is famous for. Uh, figs and quince. I never had eaten a quince till I learned how to do Turkish cooking. And the winter fruits were oranges, bananas, uh, and spring and summer, everything is fresh. But in some regions, fruit is dried for winter use or uh, jams and preserves. And the Ottoman Empire was famous for its sweets and pastries. They had three kinds of sweets, pastries, uh, milk custards, fruit desserts, and of course, uh, baklava, which uh, it's thought that the Turks also invented. Um, this is Azur. Azur is Noah's pudding. This is the pudding that was the last meal on the ark that I told you about in the beginning when I said that uh, Noah's ark rested on Mount Arat, and the last meal on the ark was a pudding that's still served today by the name of Azur, or Noah's pudding. A lot of butter and sugar soaked with thick sugar syrup, um, no chocolate. I was kind of dismayed to find there was no chocolate, but being adaptable, I quickly learned to love sugar syrup and <laughs> instead. That was my substitute. But these sweet pastries are not served for dessert. These are served at very special parties or for tea or coffee. If you're invited to someone's house for tea or coffee, then you'll get these rich desserts. Otherwise, dessert is fruit, some type of variety of fruit or a pudding. Um, these are cookies. This is what got me into Turkish cooking, was the little almond cookie on the right. I was invited to a luncheon at the ambassador's home, uh, which is magnificent, one of the grand homes of Washington. And it was very sweet, coated with sugar, and I ate 12 of them. And <laughs> that was after pigging out on this meal. And so I asked one of the gentlemen who was serving what this cookie was because I knew I wanted to make this cookie and uh, he said Shakespeare okay I went home and wrote down Shakespeare so I called the ambassador's wife's press secretary the next day and I said I was at the party yesterday and I need the Shakespeare cookie recipe and she said we have no Shakespeare cookie recipe I said yes you do she said no we don't I said don't tell me I ate 12 I said, I'll tell you what, I'll call back in an hour. Please find the recipe for me. So I called back and she says, do you mean shaker pare? I said, yes, that's what I said. Shakespeare, S-H-A-K-P, it's all the same. And that's when I knew that I had to learn um, Turkish cooking. And I began writing the Turkish, first Turkish book with the ambassador's wife. Uh, the other interesting thing I learned was I discovered this little shortbread cookie. Now, shortbread cookies aren't especially sweet for someone that's a sugar and chocolate addict, but the chatal was really good. I found them almost addictive. And so Nur was in Ankara, 
And I called her and I said, oh, I found this new cookie. Uh, we can put it in our book, the book that is here. And she said, there was a dead silence. I know I'm in trouble with Nur when there's dead silence. She said, Sheila, we don't put cookie recipes in our cookbook. Recipes, <laughs> cookies are not dessert. Okay, Cookies are only served when ladies go to gossip and have tea and coffee. So there is no chata <laughs> recipe in our book. But now we're going to go to a celebration feast at the palace for dinner with the Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. Now, um, that's what Europeans called him, Suleiman the Magnificent. The Ottomans called him the lawgiver. The palace, now known as Topkapı, was divided into courts. So when you entered the first court, this was the most accessible to everybody. And the fourth court was the most uh, private. And this is the entrance to the palace. <clears throat> when you enter through the imperial gate, you find the barracks of the Janissaries. And nobody is challenged to enter the first court. You just walk in. Uh, if you're an artisan, a craftsperson, anybody off the street, uh, a beggar, a lawyer, whatever. You can go through this gate and into the first courtyard and nobody will bother you. Everybody is welcome. Now, the Janissaries were members of an elite corps. They were the first Ottoman standing army. And the sultans found them around 1365. Now, anybody know about the Janissaries? I hate to say this, but they were children who were conscripted from Christians and other religions to grow up and be soldiers for the Sultan's private army. So they went around taking from the Balkans um, and they became the property of the Sultan and most of them eventually converted to Islam. But over time, this army gained great power and they were so successful at what they did, they became one of the strongest institutions in the empire. In 1574, there were 20,000 of them. In 1826, there were 135,000 of them. Uh, now, they had a very interesting occupation or charity function. They ran eating houses, which they knew as soup kitchens. And this was to feed the poor. And these were always attached to a mosque complex and their only aim was to feed the poor. And above anything else, the Janissaries prized their soup cauldrons, so much so that on the front of their caps, um, they had a little gilded or jeweled ornament that a soup spoon would be placed in. So they always had their soup spoon. And the cauldron uh, would show up on their banners. So they started the first charity soup kitchens and soup was their thing. They wore all kinds of varied ornate headdresses. Uh, some of them had bird of paradise feathers that went from their heads down to their waists. And their battalions were organized the same way the, the Sultan's kitchen were organized. Uh, the cauldrons of the soups were used to cook pilaf soups and Noah's pudding. Azure. And this is the Janissary. Here's one of them carrying a symbolic soup spoon. And different color clothing, turbans, and boots would designate what rank a person in the Janissaries was. Now, this is the um, second court. And during the 16th century, it was wood. It enclosed a lot of beautiful gardens of cypress trees and fountains. There was gazelles and peacocks. And here you would find government officials and visiting envoys. And it housed um, a place where the government could meet, an assembly hall. It also housed the harem and the palace kitchens. Now, the palace kitchens were set up to feed up to 10,000 people a day. These are just some of the silk court costumes. And this is the style of clothing you would have found if you were an invited guest. Now, to enter the kitchen, you go through a long, narrow inner court that connects eight kitchens. Each was a lofty chamber with a big dome roof. 
and cauldrons were suspended by chains from the ceiling. Uh, iron bars held them up. And there were cooking assistants over all of the fire pits who would do nothing but raise and lower the cauldrons to adjust the heat or stir the contents of the pot. Now, each of the kitchens had its own head chef, plus apprentices, plus workmen. And each of 150 cooks had specific duties uh, to cook to perfection courses of soups, roasted meats, pilafs, and desserts. Um, the head of the kitchen warden was equivalent to the head of the whole army. That's how important the kitchen warden was. And during the period of 1574 to 1595, the kitchen staff was over 1,100 uh, cooks and their assistants. Now, the palace cooks were to feed the members of the councils on the day they met, and they had to prepare food for 5,000 public people uh, on special days when the emperor or the sultan would designate that the poor and the citizens of the empire were to be fed. Uh, this was an honor and an obligation of the sultan under Islamic law. And eventually the kitchens grew to a dozen, and each one cared for a specific person or a group, like the sultan, the harem, the royal princes, members of the council. One kitchen was just designated for nothing but sweets and drinks. Um, if you attended a feast for a inv visiting ambassador or envoy, which was for males only, you would enter the great dining hall with walls covered in ceramic tiles of floral designs with vines and carnations, roses and tulips. Um, roses, carnations, and tulips are the, the flowers of Turkey. Most tables were circular and very low with plush cushions or rugs instead of chairs, and you would sit cross-legged. And usually there would be a visa or an ambassador uh, who sat at a silver table. These are some of the court decorations that you might see on um, the people that were attending this kind of back. And these are uh, some of the accoutrements that you could be served from. Now, there could be 50 to 100 courses. And 2,000 very richly dressed courtiers uh, would wear silk satins and velvets or a suit of gold threads, which would be what the ambassador wore. And again, the cut and color of the garments, the shape and size of the turban would determine what rank uh, the guest was. So just by looking at somebody, even without an introduction, uh, you would know where they, they placed in the rank. Um, you would begin to smell the wonderful aromas that would come into the hall um, of cinnamon and saffron and lavender. Now, the meal was carried in on huge round trays, either of gold, silver, or copper, or Chinese porcelain. If you get to go to Top Kappa Palace, they have one of the most fabulous Chinese porcelain collections anywhere. They began collecting very, very, very early when they first began to trade uh, with China. Your main course might be chicken or lamb and a pomegranate sauce with pilafs and uh, the flavors of candy fruits and sorbets would be dessert. Now, dinnerware was comprised of Chinese porcelain, dishes of gold, dishes of silver, and crystal, and usually they would have rare jewels embellished uh, along the interior or the exterior of the dishes. Now, spoons were foremost of importance, and they came in many sizes and shapes because they were used for soups, pilafs, puddings, stewed fruit, tea, and coffee. And if uh, you sat at a table where, which was a communal table, where a big dish of um, pilaf, a covered dish, was put down in front of you, then you had to have a long-handled spoon so you could reach and fight the others for what was in that, that communal dish. Now, spoons were so important because meats and things were so tender, they were eaten with the hand. So really, your spoon was your most important utensil. They were kept in beautifully carved or painted spoon holders or embroidered bags, and they were made by special craftsmen who specialized in carving wooden spoons. And even the simplest would have wonderful decorations. Now, spoons for the richer would be made of tortoise shell, silver, gold, mother of pearl, and would be set with the coral, ivory, or precious gems. Um, 
Now, if you decided to have a large party uh, for your friends, uh, the cutlery could be a problem because nobody had enough spoons uh, to feed usually their guests. That meant everybody had to bring their own spoon. And so you would show up with your own spoon in a beautiful bag of velvet or satin or embroidered of gold thread or maybe jewel encrusted. And each bag would be a wonderful uh, masterpiece of needlework and the finest spoon you owned. So when you sat down, everybody wanted to see your spoon, <laughs> to see if your spoon was nicer than their spoon. Um, rivalry over spoons was hardly good manners, but women used to warn their daughters to uh, stop gossiping, stop looking, pick up your own spoons and get on with the eating, uh, leading to a rhyme, add not word to word, but take spoons to rice. Uh, people did not converse or talk during dinner. Uh, they just ate. Uh, food was either cut into bite-sized pieces or, again, it was just torn with the hands. No knives or forks were used, uh, only two spoons, one for your savory and the other for your sherbet or your sweet dessert. Uh, fingers were the utensils of choice. And these are some of the types of pots and pans that the servants would cook in or would serve in. And when they would come in with one of the, the dishes, they would always announce what it was before they put it down so you would know what you were going to be eating. There was no guessing about, mm, what is that? You know, maybe I'm not going to like it. Uh, the aromas were always enticing and the flavors memorable. And bread was always served in abundance. Now you might have um, grape leaves stuck with lamb and plums, you could have onion fritters, you could have savory layered bread, wheat berry soup, uh, yogurt was used in soup and sauces and main courses and desserts, cheeses, olives were also served. Entrees um, at the palace included a variety of meat dishes which were roasted, stewed, or baked in a pastry. And dishes also included a variety of rices, vegetables, uh, the vegetables could be with the meats, uh, pickled. Um, in summer, the Turks would serve uh, salad, but in the winter, you got pickles as the next course or as the accompaniment. Some food was fried in batter or stuffed with filling. Sauces were all but non-existent, and that's why the Sultan's delight is so unusual, uh, because usually sauces are just something made with yogurt, uh, not with bechamel. And um, Monty, uh, I told you, was the little teeny raviolis. Now, the desserts um, could be all types of things. Um, the cooks in the palace were very creative, and uh, they liked to put on a good display. They used a lot of sponge sugar. They would create whole gardens of animals and people all made out of sponge sugar that would go on the table. Uh, lakes and fountains and shrubs and flowers were made out of sugar and every kind of animal. Cardamom was very popular during this period of cooking. And creamed rice pudding, stuffed pastries with marzipan, baklava. Uh, baklava was used at all circumcisions. That was the dessert that would be served if you were invited to a circumcision. I noticed that in other religions too. Amy, didn't, didn't uh, the Arabs also uh, use the baklava, yeah. And chickpeas were also used among the different religions for special occasions. Uh, creamed rice was popular and a sweetened uh, yellow pudding. Now the preferred drink of the Ottomans for breakfast was tea. And they love apple tea, uh, something you have to acquire a taste for. But coffee was the preferred drink as part of the banquet. And um, for a long time, coffee was not an acceptable drink because it was thought to intoxicate the sultan, and the sultan needed to have all his wits about them, so it was more or less banned. But um, eventually, it became acceptable, and they were allowed to have it. Uh, and in finishing, I just wanted to talk about baklava for a minute. Every month uh, of Ramadan, the Ottoman sultans had trays of baklava made for the Janissaries. Uh, there would be one tray for every 10 soldiers. 
and each tray would be covered by a silk cloth and delivered to the Janissary uh, barracks. Now, if the trays were returned the following day uh, with nothing on them, everything was fine between the Sultan and the Janissaries. Don't forget, we're talking about hundred and some thousand soldiers that are sitting right there in the palace grounds. But if something was left on the trays when it was returned to the Sultan, then the Sultan knew there was a problem. And a number of periods of history had Janissary revolutions. So the Sultan had to be very careful uh, how he treated these people. And there were guilds. You, depending on what kind of cook you were, uh, you belonged to a cooking guild. And whirling dervishes um, said that uh, the chefs were expected to cook those around them, meaning the apprentices, so that the people, the idea of people being absorbed into the food or their spirits uh, absorbed into the food. So many uh, refinements of this cuisine were maintained down to the dissolution of the empire in World War I. And today, modern Turks are very proud of their culinary heritage and are the only people in the Middle East who seriously study their food history. Uh, there are restaurants in Istanbul today that still serve uh, court dishes, while others are um, more into what I call the home cooking uh, that you might find in the restaurants here. Every now and then, a court dish might show up. Today, there are seven regions in Turkey. Each has a different climate and geography and indigenous agriculture products, cultures, customs. Um, the Turks are masterful at successfully combining three of the most important things in life, food, family, and friends. Um, Turkish food then and Turkish food now, fresh, seasonal, regional. Again, the basis of many of the new diets for today. So foreign trade and dominance and a deep respect for the culinary arts have made modern Turkey a paradise for food lovers. No matter where you travel in Turkey, delicious homemade breads, fresh quality ingredients, and traditional recipes will beckon you to the table. According to Turkish tr tradition, a stranger at one's doorstep is considered a guest from God and should be accommodating accordingly. So if you're fortunate enough to be a guest in a Turkish person's home, Rest assuredly, that Mediterranean fusion meal probably awaits you. So thank you so much for coming, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Sheila, very much. Uh, we have time for a few questions and answers. Get yourselves to the nearest Turkish restaurant <laughs> quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's wonderful, isn't it? Not to see McDonald's. Or Pizza Hut? <laughs> Very inexpensive. I tell people that if you go to Turkey, you get so much bang for your dollar as, as compared going to Greece. Uh, it, it's totally different. And most Turks speak uh, some, if not a lot, of English. So it's not like you have a problem. They're very friendly. They'll take you by the hand and take you where you want to go if they're not trying to drag you into their brother's rug shop. Um, but uh, it's just, you can't, you can't spend enough time in Turkey. It's so big and it's so different. And what you eat in Istanbul, 40 miles away, they might never have heard of. When I asked Nur about this cookie, Chital, she'd never heard of it. She'd never eaten it in her life. So from village to village or region to region, it, it's just, the food is absolutely spectacular and very, very, very different. There's two things that kind of call Turkish delight. One is those fried funnel cakes, as I call them, that we have and that also you get at the Greek fairs. You know, they take some batter and they pour it into the boiling oil and then they dip it in honey syrup. That's, some people call that Turkish delight. But then there's the Turkish delight candies, which I love, uh, that are infused with rose water or orange blossom or pistachios or other little things and are cut in the little tiny squares and dusted with coconut or uh, sugar. Um, that's definitely a, a Turkish thing. You really don't find that. Uh, 
yes. Uh, too many places other than, than Turkey. They do sell them in the Mediterranean markets around town because I've seen them. I think they're under $7 for a, a box of them. There are a lot of uh, Mediterranean markets that have uh, Turkish ingredients. Um, and uh, sometimes you can buy the simen, the, the round breads that look like bagels, but they're thinner, and they have the uh, black seeds on top. They eat those daily for breakfast. It was very interesting. Uh, to eat at the ambassador's house and have Turkish breakfast. Turkish breakfast, everything is homemade. The bread is homemade. All the jams and preserves were homemade. There was always a dish of olives, a dish of cheeses, uh, yogurt, and tea. And that would be a Turkish breakfast. Um, they eat three meals a day. Uh, sometimes the big meal is lunch and sometimes the big meal is supper. I think it would depend whether it's where there's an agricultural community and they eat their bigger meals at, at lunchtime so they have strength to go back to, to work. They don't take siestas uh, in Turkey. Um, but the seafood and it just everything is just amazing there. I mean, it's a phenomenal part of the world and when you think that for five or six hundred years um, how advanced they were compared to what was going on in quote, modern Europe of the 15, 1600s, even the 1700s. Uh, it's, it's really an interesting culture uh, to study and to learn about. And as I said, I found that most Americans did not know that Istanbul is the only city on two continents, half in Asia, half in, in Europe. In fact, I was going to the Asian half for, for dinner, and I crossed a bridge, and there was a big beltway green sign that said, uh, Welcome to Asia. So I called my husband. I said, hey, I could, I could be in Iraq for dinner in seven hours or something. It was, it, you never had a, I never had a sense of how close things were uh, to Turkey. And then you cross the bridge, and you're in the European side. And the Crusaders had to come to Istanbul uh, to cross the Bosporus to continue on down to the Holy Land. And if any of you you know, know the story about the Crusades and uh, how the emperor had asked the pope for some, uh, what do you call when you hire mercenaries to come and protect him. And the pope came up with a brilliant idea of sending 100,000 crusaders to Istanbul where he expected the emperor to feed and house and take in these horde of people and then transport them by boat across the Bosporus so they could go on to the Holy Land. That went on for 12 years, and the emperor just closed the doors of the city and, and refused. Um, so it, it's the main part of the Silk Road. Um, people do not realize uh, the Silk Road is a misnomer. There is three Silk Roads and a sea Silk Road, but people over centuries have just come to call it the Silk Road. Uh, but they're really, in reality, were the four different routes that traveled. But everything went through uh, Istanbul or Constantinople at the time. So if you'd like to look at my book, you're more than welcome. If I can answer oh, any sure. more questions or There's sign any. There's a book signing Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Anybody that's interested in uh, she was There's a wonderful uh, Turkish restaurant. I like to go to McLean to Kazam where it's real home cooking, inexpensive, wonderful lunches and dinners. Um, Agora on 18th, approximately 18th and K, has uh, Mezzi's, uh, Devon down in, in Georgetown. Um, they're not a lot, but they're all really good, and each one is different. Thank you very much, Sheila. So, I guess. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.